meeting, everyone. Uh, welcome to Bay Harbor Island's uh, uh, Council Chambers. I'm Ron Watson, the town manager. Before we start, I'd like to uh, let you know that, um, again, welcome. We have a lot of our elected officials here, our mayor, vice mayor, or all our council councilmen or council members. We have former mayors. We have residents from Bay Harbor Islands, and I see some faces I don't recognize. But you're all welcome here today. I'm here with uh, Kathleen Kaufman, head of the Historic Preservation Division of the Miami County, Miami-Dade County, Sarah Cody, assistant, and Jeff Branson is also here with them. They were good enough to come out tonight and do a presentation at, at our request about historic preservation. Uh, once that's concluded, Kathleen said she'll entertain some questions, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Ron. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for coming and giving up your um, evening. That's really nice of you. I have left. My name is Kathleen Kaufman, and I'm the Historic Preservation Chief for Miami-Dade County. I have left some materials on the back table for all of you to pick up at your leisure. Um, there's some articles and some other things there for you. Uh, a walking brochure of downtown Miami and also my card is on the table so if anybody needs my information you can pick up one of my cards what I'm going to do tonight is give you a brief overview of historic preservation at the county what we do why we do it what it means what it doesn't mean um, and it, we will touch on why we think Bay Harbor Islands is special but I really, and we will entertain some questions um, at the end of the presentation. I would ask you though, if you have individual questions about a particular building that I'd really rather not get into that tonight, you can take my card, I will come out, I will meet you, you can call, you can email, but we would really rather leave the questions to be general preservation questions. So I will get on to the presentation. Can you hear me like that? No, right? It's it's like yeah, that. Okay. So our office is the his, serves as the historic preservation board for 24 municipalities in the county. Uh, there are 10 municipalities that have their own historic preservation board and staff and ordinance, and the other 24 are served by our historic preservation board. Some of these uh, municipalities don't have a whole lot going on preservation-wise, and some are more active. Bay Harbor Islands is, is one of the ones that is under us. Uh, some of the functions that our office does, we administer the Ad Valorem Tax Exemption Program. That is something available to property owners who want to rehab a historic building. Uh, we are staff to the County Historic Preservation Board. Um, our program has just been identified as a model program by the Florida Department of State. We provide technical assistance to owners of historic properties. That usually ends up saving the homeowners some money because we are able to guide them in a way that helps them better clarify the, their project or historic preservation needs. We assist the local municipalities in obtaining historic grants. We identify and designate um, buildings and structures and archaeological sites. And we are one of the liaisons with the state for the county's uh, affordable housing and low-income grant programs. That's just some of the things we do. That's sort of, some of that's not very exciting, but I'm going to show you Quickly, I know you want to talk about Bay Harbor Islands, and we're going to get there. But I want to I want to show you quickly some of the projects that we do because I think it's important for you to know what our office does. One of the things projects we just finished up is the Richmond Naval Air Station. This was built in 1942, beginning of World War II. This is down by uh, Metro Zoo, Zoo Miami, and. This was the administration building for the Richmond Naval Air Station base, which housed the blimps that would circle around uh, the tip of Florida and identify the German U-boats in the water. After the hurricane of 1945, 
most of the base was leveled, as in that top left picture. And then after Hurricane Andrew, that the other two pictures are the condition of the administration building. So when we first decided to get involved and fund the restoration of this building, that's the shape it was in. It was on federal land, so we had to jack up the building on hydraulics and move it uh, about a mile so it would be off of federal land so that people can use the building. Uh, we completely gutted the inside, and this is it today. When the interior restoration is completed, it will become the Miami Military Museum. Hampton House Motel is probably about two months away from um, opening, which is very exciting. This is a mid-century resource off of 27th Avenue in Brownsville, the Brownsville area, just north of the 112. So the Hampton House, uh, you know, in that time period, we were still segregated, and a lot of the... Um, uh, major jazz singers and celebrities, they all came here to perform for the African American community. So Cab Calloway, Duke Ellington, Sammy Davis Jr., lots of people performed at, and stayed at the historic Hampton House. We do know that Martin Luther King was uh, there three or four times at least. Um, we have some evidence that he wrote maybe a draft of the I, ha I Have a Dream speech at this facility. And at the bottom picture, you see Malcolm X taking a picture of uh, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, um, at the um, coffee counter. So this is, it was boarded up in 1972, abandoned in 72, and this is the condition it was in when we started the restoration of couple years ago. It was literally just walls being held up by some bracing. This is it about a month ago. So we are retaining the historic aspects of it that we can, including the original railings and so forth. But most of the interior is being completely redone to serve as museum space, community, event room. And there's an aerial of it. So our archaeologist, Jeff Ransom, is here today. Raise your hand, Jeff. Um, the, he has worked over a year at this site. This is the Tequesta Village that they found in downtown Miami. Uh, the red circles and the blue lines that you see there, the blue lines indicate post hole, linear, linear post holes that they found, and the red circles indicate where they have found what they think are platforms to some kind of circular structure. So about 2,500 years ago, that lot, that lot right there, was the site of a Tequesta Indian village. Now amazingly enough, on the same site was uh, Fort Dallas from the second Seminole Indian War period. And on the same site, Henry Flagler decided to build his Royal Palm Hotel there. Really significant, significant site if you're talking about the history, the early history of Miami. So the circular holes with the baby powder around it is one of the concentric circles they found that they think is some kind of platform for a circular structure from the Tequesta Indian period. And the odd-shaped hole in the ground is, that looks like a D is uh, the well from Fort Dallas period. The steps are from the foundation from the Royal Palm Hotel. So, sign of the times. So what do we talk about when we're talking about the community of uh, character, community, and what we do and build as a, as a culture and as a people? So the things that we produce as a society is really reflective of what's going on in our environment, okay, in our, what the available technologies. That translates into what the clothing fashion is of the day, what the music is you're listening to at the time, the kinds of transportation 
social movements that are happening, movies, uh, the built environment. Out of all of these things, the built environment is the most permanent. Okay? So if you go to a party, you're not necessarily going to hear a lot of classical music. That's just not what we're listening to today. You don't see a lot of people wearing clothing from the 40s. But I bet you, you could tell me what era this is. So the clothing, the buildings, the, the, the cars that we are driving, they are all reflective of a period of time that we lived in. Obviously, that's the 20s, right? What decade is that? I know exactly where I was when the Challenger blew up. So this is obviously the 80s. And the buildings kind of reflect that. In Miami, in the 1950s, we were entering this new era. Okay, We were coming out of the Art Deco period. The war had ended, the GIs were coming home, and they were starting to move into town at a very, very, very high rate. We were mass producing housing to accommodate that. There was a lot more car travel because people could now afford cars. There was a lot more airplane travel. It's the birth of rock and roll, actually. So this was reflected in everything from graphic design and our space exploration. Uh, the whole civil rights movement was starting to happen. This was reflected in our architecture and in the interior design. Our cars looked a certain way, our clothing looked a certain way, and our music. So it's during this time that we see the rise of a new type of architecture. It, Art Deco had really started in the 20s and had gone through the 30s and was finally dying out as a style by the mid 40s. So I know a lot of you may have heard of a term called MIMO. That's short for Miami Modern. MIMO, Miami Modern. What's Miami modern? It's actually um, mid-century modern, okay? Mid-century modern is the correct term for it that everyone in the country uses. Miami modern is how our culture and our environment here in South Florida really um, influenced the mid-century movement. So it's, it is mid-century but it was all built really to play to our environment. The MIMO, it's what's interesting though, MIMO, at, can you still hear me? Okay. I just, this feels weird, but I feel like I'm eating the microphone. But, um, it is, the term MIMO as a historic style, if you will, is a locally, statewide, and nationally recognized style. This book came out in 2004. It was written by Eric Nash and Randall Robinson. And this, this really sort of helped solidify and define what MIMO architecture is. In 2006, the city of Miami designated their first commercial historic district and called it the MIMO Biscayne Boulevard Historic District. The state helped um, Miami Beach come up, you know, that they wanted to do two major districts that were 75% mid-century resources, MIMO resources. So through the state, they got to the federal government and those became national registered districts. So now, the federal government and the Department of the Interior recognize MIMO in mid-century as a historic resource. So what are some of the elements of design for mid-century? Remember, it's coming out of the whole Art Deco and the Streamline Modern movement. 
and it's moving a little bit more into very space age influenced elements. Um, a lot of geometric shapes. Uh, you have a lot of the V-wing roof, roof lines. A lot of jealousy window. Jealousy window was becoming a, a very big thing in the 50s. You have a lot of the punched block wall or screen wall. It's called a couple of different things. You have a lot of cor um, windows that wrap the corner of the house. So all these different elements, architectural elements, help make up and define what is MIMO, architecture. These are some more local examples. Some of these are North Bay Village, and I think the one on the right is Bay Harbor Island, right bottom. But again, you can see they, they mix up the building material so it's not just plain stucco on the wall. You have a um, brick facing, a lot of brick facing, a lot of vertical type elements that are still reminiscent of the Art Deco era. A lot of these uh, geometric patterns and shapes in the railings of buildings. Horizontal banding around the windows. You'll also see a lot of projected, what we call eyebrows, these deep um, window and roof covers, basically, over the doors and windows. That's called a projecting eyebrow. The left picture is actually the um, Pan Am headquarters, the old Pan Am headquarters that's on it, Miami International Airport property. The cutout in the roof, very, very reminiscent of Milo architecture. And it even, ref you know, it's even reflected in our furniture. So all the things that were happening in the 50s affected our style of clothing, our music, our furniture, the movies that were being produced, and the architecture. So Shepard Broad had this crazy vision Let's turn this marshland into a city. It was, it was actually, I don't know how they do that. Like, how do you build an island? It's crazy. So he came from Russia in 1920 as a 13-year-old, and then seven years later was graduating from law school in New York. That's driven. <laughs> Um, he and what his wife Ruth came to South Florida in 1940 and he acquired two what were basically mangrovey type swamps um, in 1945. Uh, he joined up with a, a man named Benjamin Kane for your Kane concourse and I'm sure most of you know all of this already but the town of Bay Harbor Islands was incorporated in 1947. So this is very interesting. The town was incorporated in 1947, and 12 years later, it's fairly built out. That's a really significantly quick building phase for any town like that. Now, he wasn't satisfied with just having any regular architects come build his buildings on the island, he, they chose some of the best architects of the era to build buildings on the island, including Morris Lapidus, who did the Fountain Blue and the Eden Rock. He did over 1,200 buildings and 250 hotels. Norman Giller, another really famous mid-century architect, he did the Diplomat Hotel, Singapore Hotel. Um, his granddaughter actually just finished, well, it's a couple years old now, but this book is now out about designing the good life, about Norma Giller. Igor Polovitsky, another very, very prolific architect of mid-century. I think the sea tower in Fort Lauderdale is still there, actually. Yes. Yeah. So you have all these Charles McKeerahan. He did the Mai Kai restaurant. That's up in Fort Lauderdale. 
The Castaways Island Hotel, which I don't think is there anymore. Uh, the Manhattan Tower is still there from 1953. And interestingly enough, that Manhattan Tower, you know, has similar characteristics to the birdcage of the Bay Harbor Club. He also did the Bay Harbor Towers. This is an article of ad advertisement from 1957 in the Miami News. And I thought it'd be funny to show you that the ad says, you can have your choice of colored appliances. So if you wanted the avocado green, that was yours. Yours to have. And the one bedroom, one bath uh, cooperative apartment was $14,900. So the community today is very interesting because it still retains a lot of these uh, buildings from that era. Uh, and I'm not picking on any building in particular. I, I am just wanting to show you some of the some of the buildings that show you what some of the MIMO style, they exhibit features of this MIMO style, mid-century style. This building has all kinds of great things going on. It has brick, not just the uh, stucco, it has jealousy window, it has beam poles, those skinny little vertical poles are called beam poles. The, um, the roof is cut out, it's got all kinds of crazy stuff going on. <laughs> This one has another another uh, roof that has the cutouts and the beam poles. This one has a very interesting front entrance facade with the banding around the windows. These kind of like these great geometric pylons off the end of each building. Again, rough rough faced brick, and that that is one of the that's the eyebrow coming across the tops of the windows, these served dual purposes, okay? The eyebrows were meant to shield from the, very good, and the block walls, the punched concrete screen walls, they were meant, they had a function too. They were meant to still let breeze through, but shield you from the sun. This, is really pretty. And see that it still has its original uh, railings with the geometric shapes in it. It's got windows that wrap the corner, which aren't even allowed by code anymore. It's a really great feature. Um, Jalousy windows too. Rough face, the brick mixed with the smooth stucco. You have horizontal banding around the windows. Here you have a screen wall. And notice the mix of materials on the building. So what could have been a very plain building, just by mixing up the materials a little bit, makes it more visually interesting. This is the Continental, the Charles McCarahan building. This is another Charles McCarahan building right next to it. It's called the Bay Harbor Club. It, these are... Uh, the V-shaped beam poles, the geometric uh, railing. That's, that's the birdcage in the front of the building. Cheese holes. Look at this wall full of cheese holes. Like, they didn't have to do that, but it makes it so much more interesting, right? Yep. And then you have the, the zigzag entrance feature. This is an A. Herbert Math Mathis building called the Mediterranean. Mediterranean. That is a massive screen wall right there. <laughs> but it lets the light and the breeze in without baking you on the inside. It does serve a purpose. Here's just another really interesting example of how they chose to use rough-faced brick, down, down one column, banding around the windows, geometric block walls. The racing stripes is also pretty uh, prevalent in some, in some mid-century buildings. 
So when we talk about community character, it's about why do people live here? What brought people here to begin with? And why do you stay here? And why do you invest in your property here? And why do you come to work here? Well, over the couple of years that we've been talking to people about Bay Harbor Islands, we've heard these, are any of these not true? Because this is what we have heard why people come to Bay Harbor Islands. It has a good school. It has quiet neighborhoods. It has, there's minimal traffic. You have access to good retail and restaurants close by. You have waterfront views. You have parks, at, may I? I don't know if you have parks and open space, but that's what we hear. And you have a sense of history. Close to the ocean. Close to the ocean. Oh, yeah. oh waterfront access, yes. But for example, the, the bottom picture just shows that a lot of the original properties that were built on this island provided the building, the people that lived in that building with a lot of green and open space. And so what I want to show you is just sort of a comparison. It's going to be hard to do without a little pointy thingy. Let me see if it works up there. Oh, it doesn't. It works up there, but it doesn't work on the screen. Okay. So, the original buildings in Bay Harbor Islands, you have a lot of what we call garden style apartments. That is a building typology where everyone's door opens up onto some kind of courtyard or green space. Some of them, some of the, the major green space was in the back of the building. But you can see how much green space is afforded to all the residents. Green space, there's a courtyard here. Green space, green space. And then some of the taller buildings, some of the newer buildings, are not providing as much green space because they're building out the whole lot. And that's just the way development kind of goes today, right? They try to max out their, their right to build. What is interesting, though, is to see how much of the taller buildings start casting shadows on the rest of the buildings. So that's a very deep shadow. This one goes two or three properties over. So you want to just be aware that sometimes the new, the new infill, and it's necessary for cities to grow and, and have new construction, but you just kind of want to be aware of how that might be changing the character of your community. I think we're aware of it. That's over here. Anyway. So as a lot of you are aware, there's a lot going on in the town, building-wise. As I said, new infill is necessary, okay? But depending on how it's done, it can quickly change the character of your neighborhood. Um, so while some of these buildings may be fine individually, you have to. You just have to wonder if they're respecting the history of the of the city. So I'm going to go quickly over the process of historic designation because there's a lot of confusion with that. I got it down to one slide. You should be very impressed with that. And I can I can provide you with a copy of this presentation if you want it you know just email us or we can print it out for you and mail it to you it's fine but if you start at the top left okay a property of interest is brought to the historic preservation board not me staff doesn't decide what becomes historic or not it goes to the preservation board top middle the Historic Preservation Board determines if it could be eligible for designation. Top right. If they do decide it could be eligible for designation, then a moratorium is placed 
on demolitions or alterations for no more than 60 days and they have to we have to do notifications to everybody affected about the public hearing bottom right a public hearing is held by the historic preservation board that hearing must be held within 60 days of them starting the process because there's a moratorium on the building and it's not fair to keep make people have a very long time with the moratorium bottom middle uh, a designated okay so if the historic preservation board at the hearing decides to designate a building bottom middle the designation can be appealed and that appeal goes to the board of county commissioners bottom left if someone still doesn't like the decision of the board of county commissioners that decision can also be appealed to the circuit court is anyone eligible to appeal yes anyone's eligible to appeal but not anyone is eligible to propose a designation who is you have to be a property owner staff or the historic preservation board to propose it can you ask that question at the end I could but I'm asking it now oh, okay people on the historic preservation board there's 13 members each commission each county commission has a appointee to the historic preservation board so the benefits of historic designation obviously I tailored it to Bay Harbor Island but it could be any anywhere we, we would say it promotes and protects Bay Harbor Island's unique and irreplaceable history it makes properties that are designated eligible for the ad valorem tax exemption it provides property owners with access to county technical service whether that be for grant purposes architectural reviews whatever uh, historically designated buildings are exempt from certain provisions of the building code and neighborhoods with historic resources have higher property values than adjacent neighborhoods without any protected resources now I know that property values is a huge question and nobody thinks that designation would increase their property values we have tons and tons and tons of research and different reports that say otherwise I I've only brought a selection with me today um, but this is this is one that was done by Rutgers Center for Urban Policy Research and the Penn State University Depart Department of Economics it went through nine major cities in Texas and it determines that historic preservation has a positive impact on property values the average value increase after designation the average value increase was between five and twenty percent that's this study that's this study here you can have a copy of it yes what happens in Texas is hang on there's reports from every state Donovan Ripkema is an economic development expert he's written numerous publications including the economics of historic preservation okay he is really considered to be like the Steve Jobs of historic preservation because he's invited he represents the United States all over the world talking about preserving historic resources and the effects that that has on economic growth development and property values one of his main things throughout his his speeches and his presentations is about properties that are within local historic districts appreciate at rates greater than the local market overall and faster than similar non-designated neighborhoods 
Recent analysis indicates that historic districts are also less vulnerable to the volatility that often affects real estate during interest rate fluctuations and economic downturns. That is his website. I encourage you to go to it, placeeconomics.com. It's a fascinating website. You'll get a lot of information from there. This is the, a recent 2013-2014 study by the Utah Heritage Foundation. They found that foreclosure rates were 100% lower in the historic districts than, the, than anywhere else within that city that they studied. They also um, had a section where they interviewed why people bought in those areas and the kinds of things they got were that buyers chose those places because of the quality of construction, the architectural character, controlled development of the neighborhood. Now, I know I'm showing you all these other states, but in Florida, we have our own study. And that's this one. Well, this is the, just, this is just the executive summary of that study. This is the economic impacts of historic preservation in Florida. It's also available online. It is done by the University of Florida College of Law in association with the Rutgers Center for Urban Policy Research. Historic property values were tracked in 19 different cities between, sorry, 18 different cities between 2001 and 2009 by the time they did their second update. In all 18 cities, None of the districts they tracked lost value. In fact, in 12 of the 18, property values appreciated at a significantly higher rate than the non-historic neighborhoods adjacent to them. I happen to understand the real estate market. I have my license. I know lots of people that are realtors. And if you talk to anybody that's experienced with selling and focusing on historic properties, they will tell you that whether it's Savannah or Morningside or Palm Springs, California, San Francisco, Miami Beach, the places that are designated as historic do not, are not as affected in the hard economic times as other places, as the neighborhoods that are not designated. What designation does not do? Thank you for hanging in there. I'm almost done, I swear. Okay. Designation does not regulate interior spaces or individual units. Okay, the only time we, we, we regulate interiors is when it's specified in a designation report for like the SCIA. Of course, that's, that interior is regulated or the Dade County Courthouse and all the beautiful mosaics. But normally, interiors or individual units are not regulated. The Some of the exterior may be, yes. We do not regulate how the building is used. If you want to use it as apartments or office or condo or whatever, great. We have nothing to do with that. We do not require the owner to automatically then go out and do some additional repairs just because you become designated. We do not prevent alterations to the building. We do not, we do try our best not to prevent development. Rather, we're trying to encourage appropriate and sensitive development. What do I mean by compatible and sensitive development? This is the Stevens Motel in the Mimo Historic District on Biscayne Boulevard. So this center piece to the right of the picture there was all knocked down. This was a designated uh, contributing structure and they approved infill. They're keeping the two historic round end pieces and they're building something new right in the middle of it. So that's the kind of thing that you can do. Park Central, Miami Beach. This is straight from the developer's own, own papers. 
They are talking about keeping the historic building facades, but completely remodeling the interiors, which will be developed in phases. It includes a new building consisting of 12 different suites. So they're integrating old with new. This is at the 8,000 block on Harding Avenue, uh, just a little bit south of Surfside on Harding. This is not the prettiest building. I mean, it, it's just, there's nothing majorly outstanding about it, but it happens to be in one of the National Register districts. So they did have to go through a review. What they're doing is they were keep, they're keeping some of the um, character defining features like the rock, uh, the rough faced brick there and the banding around the windows, but they're actually adding another floor to these buildings. They're going up three floors and they're wiping out the interiors and making them bigger units. This is a little apartment building on Miami Beach that is in the process of applying for our ad valorem tax exemption. Why I'm showing you this, it's very interesting because the top left picture is before they started on it and that interesting uh, geometric pattern railing they really wanted to keep. Building officials said, no, you can't keep it, it's not to code, blah, blah, blah. But because it was a historic building, they worked with the building official and they added one more row of those circles <laughs> on the top of the railing. Yeah, so now it does comply with code. But they are, they are completely redoing, they gutted the interior of this building. This is one of our projects that we are responsible for reviewing. This is the Surf Club. Now this project is massive and humongous, but when our board looked at the proposal, um, I think that they realized that some negotiation was warranted because the proposal included a full restoration of the historic building. It looks like a shell now, but all of the historic interior spaces will be replaced in that building. So this is consisting of two residential towers, a four-season hotel. There's the view from the water. The surf club is going to be finally uh, open, to the, open to the public, the restaurants and the main club. This is Nadim Ashi. He is the developer for Fort Capital. He is in charge of this surf club project. In a February 2014 um, interview, he, he said, if you look at the motivation for his units that have sold thus far, I would rank having a historical site first, then adding Richard Meyer to it, and then bringing in the Four Seasons. So there are developers out there that get this. Like he knows his project and his property is going to be so unique because he has something nobody else is going to have. One last thing I just wanted to show you, again, like historic preservation is not anti-development. In fact, the National Trust for Historic Preservation put out this new study called Older, Smaller, Better. That's available online also. The whole point of this massive study was basically in this one paragraph. Communities that integrate the older buildings with the new development are the most economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable communities. Oh, yes. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Thank you for staying awake. Now, can you, if you have general preservation questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. When the preservation board considers a building or not, does it take into consideration if all of the owners are not in favor of it? Does it take into consideration if all does the preservation board, when they are considering a building, take into account the owners who are opposed to preservation? Yes. 
A public hearing is exactly that. It's supposed to be a place where anybody in favor or against comes in front of the preservation board and presents their case. Okay, the, the preservation ordinance also talks about economic hardships. So if people want to make a case for economic hardship, the preservation board has to take that into consideration as well. Can I ask why the preservation board wasn't here this evening? And also, the last meeting when they proposed a moratorium was held on a Wednesday at 2 in the afternoon when the townspeople of Bay Harbor couldn't be there. The preservation board is a quasi-judicial board. They cannot be here listening to something that could possibly come before them at a future meeting. It would be against the Jennings rule and the Sunshine violation. And Wednesdays at 2 o'clock are just always when they've had the meetings. Break tradition and have it in the evening on our island? Maybe. What's the qualifications of the preservation board members? So the historic preservation ordinance requires that all the board members be from certain fields and professions. We have to have an architect, historian, um, someone from the field of law, someone from the field of real estate, someone from the field of finance. Can you clarify for us um, people you, you approach people who are not interested in having the designation as well as people who do. You don't just wait or ask people if they want it and then proceed. So staff's general position is that we try to do a friend, what we call friendly designations, where people want the designations. Um, I'm guessing what you're referring to is some of the recent things that have come before the Historic Preservation Board. Some of, both of those which are, were um, owner petitioned and the board directed us. They were not staff initiated. So we prefer to do what's called, you know, friendly designation. And the friendly designation, excuse me, the friendly designation, what happens when the majority of the unit owners do not want the designation? And there's one more thing I'd like to say. Uh, there was a lawsuit um, uh, revolving around the surf club years ago. And um, the mic is off. All right. Anyway, when the Preservation Board designated the club as, his, as an historic site in May 2010, the property's fair market value plummeted between 30 and $50 million because of the developmental restrictions placed on it, according to the lawsuit. I was a member of that club. I know what happened. The proprietary members didn't get half of what they expected in the payout. Well, it obviously de didn't devalue it enough for Fort Capital to pick up the project. And but, but the, uh, historic, uh, yes, but the Historic but Preservation the Board lost a great deal of money on that. The Historic Preservation Board had nothing to do with that lawsuit. I think the disconnect here in general is uh, the fact that developers have a concern, which of course we had spoken to previously and you assuaged. There were two large buildings that self-reported for historical designation. There isn't necessarily an active or pending moratorium on the other properties on the island. Correct. We spoke about a week ago. I don't know if you remember. So I just wanted everybody to hear that. What's your point? <laughs> <laughs> What's your point? Seeing how we're all here right now, 
and it was just brought up before that we'd like to have a meeting at night. Can we all vote now so that we know that the next meeting will be at night and people can attend? So who do we, how do we get that to happen? How do we do it? <laughs> so what happens if you write in or all of us sign right now a petition? Can we give that to you to give to the board? Okay, who has paper? It, it was a great presentation, by the way. I learned a lot. Um, but the thing that seems to trouble me is that if you had hypothetically a building with 10 owners and all 10 owners said no, why would a elected or designated group of people have the right in a democracy to say, we don't care? In, in line with that, the police... <laughs> on the other side of it, your presentation, as far as I saw, was very persuasive. And if the facts speak to it's a good thing to do, I would think the board and the people involved should be able to go to owners and say, hey, here are the facts. This is what's going to happen to your property. Here's what's going to happen to your community. All good things, which, which I agree with. But it's still your property, your ownership, you decide both ways, not yet. It's a good It's a good statement. And like I said before, as staff, we do not like to be in that position. Um, historic preservation legally has been challenged many times over the years. It's been upheld by many different courts in Florida. It's been upheld by the Supreme Court. So they can, they do have that authority to do it. It's not preferred. You want to do it when people are in favor of it. Sometimes we have designated things against owner wishes, and it turned out to be really the better thing to do. The owners moved on. The building stayed. Um, when we designated the MIMO Biscayne Boulevard district in Miami, there was, there was a lot of opposition. There were people in favor of it. There was a lot of opposition. I just want to make an observation. I think the Dade County Board of Commissioners are out of control. And what I mean by that is that Sally Heyman, who is our, our representative, tried to pass an ordinance that would say 75% of the unit owners of a uh, multi-unit building have to agree uh, to request the building, a building to be designated. She could not get that vote, so she reduced it to 51%. At that meeting, she could not get a second from the rest of the commissioners to vote on it. So my feeling is is that the Dade County Commissioners really don't give a damn. They just want their buildings that they want landmark, landmark. They control the board. They designate the board. Another question I have is, Terry D'Amico keeps telling us that we could use the TDRs to renovate our buildings. My question is, if you designate our island as an historic district, no building is going to take place. Who's going to buy the TDRs? And we are not a tourist attraction. We don't want to be a tourist attraction. I know I have enough problems with people coming onto my property looking at the Dexter building. And lastly, there are a lot of people here that are for designation. If you own your buildings, Talk to Kathleen tonight and say, landmark our buildings. See how many buildings are landmarked and leave the rest of the town. I 
think there was a question in there? <laughs> don't talk to me about your building tonight. Call me. Call me or email me. What about the uh, okay. fund that we're passing our building? Well, first of all, I mean, I certainly have no plans to drop a district over the entire island. Second of all, that's true. That's true. I don't know about the board. The TDR thing, your town uses TDRs a little bit differently than traditionally is done. So I know... In the city of Miami, the only place they allow TDRs is for the historic district. Um, so, and that's because they have put a height limitation on that historic district of 35 feet. And so to offer them um, some financial benefit for having done that to them because they are in a historic district, they are allowed to sell the air rights over their buildings to other developers who can use that extra height in other locations. The TDR issue is something you really need to talk to your own town officials about. It's not something we run at all. At all. Um, a lot of the reports you were referencing are talking about historic districts such as Miami Beach and other cities where they have bed and breakfast, commercial uses. One of the aspects of the East Island that's unique from some of these other places is that like 90% of the properties can only be used for residential purposes. So in your analysis and your survey, are you looking at the town's land development regulations, permitted uses? to try and see whether it makes sense to bring a historic district here given the limitation on uses, given the lack of a desire to create a tourist destination on this residential island? Well, I'm, no one's trying to create a tourist destination. Um, well, we, my point is just trying to show you how the history of the island could have a significant factor in why people like the island um, and the built environment of why people came here to begin with. I, I, are you a developer? The lawyer for the developer. Okay, now we understand. We are, but we're, we're just going to end up making, um, we're trying to just figure out what buildings from the era still retain their historic significance, still retain enough of the features from the era that would make them eligible for designation, and that's it. I mean, we're going to give those results to the town officials. We're going to give those results to the Historic Preservation Board. Have you thought of calling for volunteers first? people who would like to have Yeah, of course. Of course. And that, does that include single-family residents? Of course. West Island as well? If people want designation, they can come to us and request that we review a building to see if it's even eligible under the criteria of the ordinance. Do you only take those that request or do you seek out and see and ask people yourself? We just, staff generally just takes, well the board sometimes directs staff to go, to go, to go look at different things, so yes. talk to the people first and ask them if they would like that? Sometimes we do, Maybe yes. I get a lot more favorable response if you ask people. Maybe there are people who really, really like it, and that'll take over 12 more people who really, really don't. I'll take two more questions. I'd like to know what the process is once you put the moratorium for 60 to 60 days, let's say, on a building. What is the process? 
to give the, the designation? Like, what do you do to make it historic? So once the Historic Preservation Board directs staff to continue with the designation, we have to then go research and write up a report about the building to take back to the public hearing. That's what the public hearing is for. At that public hearing, the Preservation Board is hearing testimony. Our staff report, testimony from the residents, testimony from whoever wants to speak at the public hearing. At that public hearing is generally when they make the decision to designate a property or not. Who makes the decision? The Historic Preservation Board. I have a common question, but well, let's see, a generic question. Um, I'd like to know what happened first, the check-in or the aid, because within the last month or two or a couple months, Bay Harbor, Bay Harbor Islands has been on the agenda very few times for the Historic Preservation Board. So just recently, if you look at the agenda, you look at the minutes, Bay Harbor is very rarely spoken as far as you know, an actual discussion item just recently. A lot of what has occurred, from my understanding, started with the National uh, Historic um, Trust for Historic Preservation, that designation from the nonprofit as the East Island being uh, endangered. And that was initiated by your office. And the application was applied by your office. And I would like to know what designation or, or authority in regards to your staff came from the board or did it come from staff in regards to starting this process? Because when you go back to that, that nonprofit's designation, that was over a year ago. But the board just started talking about this in December of 2014. So it's almost been a year that the board actually took some type of conversation as per your minutes. So I'd like to know what direction from your board in regards to Bay Harbor versus staff initiative in regards to Bay Harbor. Because I'm looking at your staff working on Bay Harbor as early as January of 2014, which is almost a year before the board actually gave any type of instruction or direction. So can you just enlighten us in regards to that, please? Sure. The National Trust for Historic Preservation annually puts out an 11 most endangered sites. They get hundreds of applications every year. We have been contacted by Dade Heritage Trust, by residents in Bay Harbor Island, concerned with what they were seeing that was going on in the island even back then, a year and a half ago. We were given... Um, DBR lists, development, DRB, development review board, design review board lists that indicated the town was reviewing numerous projects, which generally meant that the existing building was going to be demolished. So in conjunction with our higher-ups who knew what we were doing and in conjunction with Dade Heritage Trust, we nominated it to the 11 most endangered. That's just, it doesn't mean anything. It is an awareness campaign done by the National Trust. They're already on to their next, this year's list. They don't live here. Yes, but we do. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Yeah. I've got a question and an observation. Um, question is, I, I believe, uh, not long ago, the trust board uh, tabled a, a vote on allowing individual municipalities under its uh, realm to opt out of its realm. And uh, uh, I guess during that tabling, I think the elected officials of this town voted to opt out. I believe in the expectations that when the vote comes back up in front of the historic preservationists or instead of in, in front of the, the board, that it would immediately become effective. Um, do you have any idea on when they plan on bringing that, that back to vote? I'd also, prior to finishing my question, or 
prior to handing the mic back over, I want to ask you why didn't you consult more with the town for your presentation? Although I liked your presentation, it was incomplete. You pointed out in a few different areas two of the larger buildings on the island, <clears throat> one on the very north part uh, and one off to the, the east. Uh, the Nautique is the most latest one that you had pointed out other than uh, one we didn't point out also. It wasn't long ago that there was a very, very strong anti-development movement on this island because of a couple of new buildings that went up that the majority of the town's people felt were incompatible with the town as it, as it stood. Um, there were numerous public hearings. There were workshops, numerous workshops. There was a, a committee set up. I sat on that committee to help designate building heights, which were limited and still are currently limited at 75 feet uh, in some areas. I think the majority of the island is limited to 65 feet. There were massive amounts of architectural uh, uh, zoning restrictions and requirements put in place, um, new zoning uh, designations across the East Island. Um, and so this town went through a great deal of public hearing, public input, and public decision making um, from its townspeople as to what should and shouldn't be built. And so really, uh, uh, your, your, the part of your presentation which talks about incompatibility, I think that was, uh, it was uncalled for it and, and uninformative. It was misleading at best. Um, so I think it's important for people to understand those who may not have participated in that uh, situation years ago, that this town has gone through a great deal of consideration for what, what is and isn't compatible. And although I personally have a great appreciation for some architecture and should that should be considered historic, I also am absolutely 100% for the private owner's property rights and their desire or in-desire to deal with it. And, and Okay, so sorry you feel that way. To answer your question about um, the opt-out, no, I don't know when that would be coming back up. Two more questions. Thank you, Kathleen. My name's Morris Broad. My father was Shepherd Broad. I have an intimate knowledge, probably more so than anyone else in this room, as to the history of Bay Harbor Islands. Might note, uh, first, Kathleen, I appreciate very much the presentation you made. You and your family have been good friends of mine for a long, long time, and I respect your professionalism and your good judgment. As far as, just as a historical note, originally my father conceived one island from the mangrove swamp. He then went to his engineer, M.B. Garris, and on the back of an envelope said, make me two islands. And MP said to him at the time, why two islands? He said, because from my experience in Miami Beach, where only single family separated from multifamily, eventually the multifamily encro uh, encroached on the single family. So he said, if I create a 150-foot waterway between the islands, there's less chance of that ever happening. And of course, it worked that way, because the West Island has been, continues to be, and I expect will always be, single-family residential. The other point I wanted to make was that there seems to be some misconception about the fact that my father had endorsed, through these different architects in Nemo, the design and development of buildings on the island. With the exception of two buildings, which he built to start with. One was an eight-unit building on East Bay Harbor Drive, which at 12 years old I worked in the summer as a kid in construction. The other was uh, the original Bay Harbor Hotel, uh, which is now called Daddio. Other than that, my father had no input whatsoever with any of the architects named. 
And by the way, I knew every one of these architects personally, with the exception of McCurehan, who was in Fort Lauderdale. But all of those architects that were mentioned in uh, uh, Kathleen's presentation, I knew personally, and I knew well. Morris Lapidus was a very, very dear friend of both my father and me. So I wanted to clarify that one point, that my father had nothing to do with the historic buildings that are supposedly designated now. His only interest was in selling the land to developers. Those developers then selected the individual architects of that time. Did Kathleen, I beg pardon? Did he didn't approve of the project? No, no, he didn't because, no. We didn't have a planning and zoning board at that point because we had 750 empty lots. <laughs> no, Norman was not. I can tell you, you're mis you are misinformed on that point. I wanted to clarify that because there is a, 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 a misconception about where my father's role was in the development of Bay Harbor Islands and Broad Causeway. What do you think you would want if he was alive today? I think my father was a visionary, without any question. He believed in looking not through the rearview mirror, but straight ahead. So I believe that my father he was also a lawyer by profession, and he believed in due process. And due process, in my opinion, having attended some of the meetings of the Preservation Board, were totally ignored. And I, and I don't ascribe that to Kathleen at all. I describe it to the members of the Board. I don't even know if the members of the Board even know some, are, know where Bay Harbor Islands is located, and I have serious doubt that any member has come to Bay Harbor Islands. I think that if we took a vote as to who is thrilled about all the properties torn down on East Bay Harbor Drive, would I hear applause here? They were just junky properties. And I suspect that if your board were involved, these buildings would still be up that we'd have to look at. These one-story, junky, falling-down buildings. So, oh, please. And the other thing is, the people who contacted you who were concerned about this island, I know some of them. They don't even pay taxes on this island. They rent. And there are several people from Bell Harbor. They should have no say in anything. really are good. Thank you so much. When the national, what is the difference between National Historic Designation and Miami-Dade? That's a great question. Um, national Register of Historic Places. National Register of Historic Places is a national, federally, federally recognized program that recognizes places and buildings of national importance. It's not regulatory at all. It's basically an honorary thing to be on it. It does not prevent developers or homeowners or anybody from tearing the building down. So the, um, the local designations are what actually protects the building. National does not. But it's a very honorary thing to be on. Well, I, I thank you for your time. I'm getting you out at 8.30. Thank you. thank you, Kathleen. And I'd like to thank the, uh, the Historic Preservation staff for coming down and, and, and giving that uh, presentation. And uh, I wish everybody a safe, uh, safe trip home and uh, good night. <laughs> Thank you.